Good afternoon and welcome to Changes in Employment Laws 2024. I'm Angela De La Husse Ashley, founder and managing attorney at De La Husse Associates, also known as DLHA Law Group. Our firm, along with Audrey G's firm, will be presenting to you today. Audrey, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Audrey G from Brown G and Wenger. And then I also have my associate, Marissa Boyd, here as well. Um, and we will be speaking to you a little bit later after Angela's group goes with regards to case law developments. Perfect. Thanks, Audrey. Sure. Um, our portion of the presentation will cover new codes and statutes for employers to know about in 2024. And as Audrey said, hers, hers will cover case law developments. The two people presenting from our law firm will be Lindsay Meyer, our senior employment attorney, and Deanna Maxfield, our associate employment attorney. Lindsay heads our employment team in advising our clients regarding state and federal employment laws and applying those laws. She also advises on handbooks, policies, and labor matters prior to hearings. Deanna is part of the labor law team, and she advises clients on labor matters as well, pre and post labor hearings, as well as in employment litigation. Uh, thank you to all the presenters, and I'll just get started. A few housekeeping items first. Uh, since I'm a lawyer, let me give you a caveat. This presentation is not intended to give you legal advice. In order to give you legal advice, we would need to sit down with you, talk to you about your situation, your facts, discuss the facts and apply the laws and then advise you accordingly. However, this is a guideline for you to use and give you some knowledge, but we recommend working with a qualified firm such as mine or Audrey's for further legal advice. Last, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions during the webinar and at the end of the webinar, and we'll address them. Um, to do so, please use the Q&A box. Don't use the chat box. The Q&A box you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and when it comes time for questions, we'll, we'll review them. Let me get started. Um, let me start by emphasizing the importance of having an up-to-date handbook. If the company's employment was a body, the handbook would be the heartbeat. It's the first place that employees go if they have an issue or questions. And you as employers need to be able to rely on its accuracy and as a guidance. It's also important that your handbook reflects the tone and the culture of your company. And we recommend working with an, an attorney to make sure it's current and accurate every year and that it's amended as needed. You also want to make sure that you have updated workplace policies and procedures and that the employees sign off on them as needed. Next, you want to make sure that your company is compliant with regard to all postings. This is including California Civil Rights Department, OSHA, and wage and hour orders, of course. And as I said, please do consult with an attorney if you have questions about any of these changes in employment laws, because there are a lot of them for 2024. And with that, let me turn it over to Lindsay. Great, thank you so much, Angela. And thank you all for joining us today during the lunch hour. We really appreciate it. As always, you can certainly count on California to have many updates uh, for each year. Um, 2024 is no different. We today are going to be highlighting some of the major ones. It doesn't mean that it's completely comprehensive. So if there's anything that's not covered, please feel free to reach out to us at the end of this presentation. We're happy to address any of um, any questions, any inquiries. But I will get us started by going over a major update, a major new obligation that's being put on employers in California, and that is the workplace violence prevention plans. So back in September of 2023, a new law was signed in um, to place and it requires virtually with some exceptions and I'll, I'll go over that, but virtually every California employer to implement a comprehensive workplace violence prevention plan with very specific requirements. So again, I'm going to go over the highlights. It, this is a very specific um, plan that has to be in place, very detailed. So you're definitely going to want to reach out to your legal counsel on this if you have any questions or concerns or need help getting this uh, plan in place. So with this new law, it's adding a section to the California Labor Code. Uh, for those of you interested, it's 
6401.9, and that will be implemented by Cal OSHA. So just as I stated uh, previously, this new law requires employers to make an effective plan that's aimed at preventing workplace violence, and it needs to be in effect by July 1st of 2024. So that doesn't mean wait until July to get going on this plan. Um, now is the time to get working on getting this plan in place. It needs to be a written plan. It can't just be a plan that you have you know, up here ready to go. It has to actually be in writing. Um, it's very comprehensive, needs to be very detailed and has to contain cover a lot of different areas. So you wanna get working on that ASAP. Now this plan can be a standalone or it can be incorporated into an already existing injury, illness, and prevention plan that your company um, likely already has in place. We recommend, since it is a new law for California, something new employers have to do to keep it separate at this point, just because inevitably there could be additions, changes, maybe things that you'll have to you know, take out. Um, so it makes it easier if it's an addendum, essentially, um, a plan that you can issue to employees and then update individually so you're not having it incorporated in your handbook and having to readjust your handbook you know, every time there's a change. But again, either way is appropriate. And before I delve deeper into the workplace violence prevention plans, I did want to mention that also this past September of 2023, Senate Bill 428 was passed. And the reason I want to mention this is because it is directly, um, it directly impacts how employers can help prevent uh, violence in the workplace um, as it, with respect to their employees and, and customers alike. Now, um, the new law expands California's workplace violence restraining order law, and it will help protect against um, certain kinds of workplace harassment in addition to act to threats and, and actual violence. So what is the law currently as far as employers being able to get restraining orders on behalf of their employees? Well, employers in, uh, in California now, employers can seek a temporary restraining order to protect employees from a person who has either engaged in violence against that person or has made a credible threat of violence. So an employer may uh, file a petition for a temporary restraining order to protect employees um, and their immediate family members uh, with respect to the actual violence and credible threats of violence. So what does that mean? For example, a former employee could send uh, maybe a text message to, that they're going to be threatening to attack <clears throat> or commit some act of violence against a current employee. So in that case, the employer can seek a court order to keep the threatening individual away from the workplace, the employee's home and other locations and prohibit that person from communicating further with that employee in any way. And of course, if the individual violates the temporary restraining order, the police will be authorized to arrest the individual and, you know, potentially criminal prosecution um, will happen against that individual. So that is what is in place now. So while the existing law does provide one avenue for employers to protect their employees using um, a temporary restraining order, um, the law covers a limited scope of misconduct and it's essentially related to violence or threats of violence. Um, so when the behavior has not involved violence or a, or a direct threat of violence, courts have typically not um, permitted re uh, granting of restraining orders um, from by the from via the employer for their employees. Um, so under the current law, uh, as it stands, for example, you could have an employee who maybe is being harassed on a daily basis by someone who's a complete stranger maybe there's an individual who's sort of obsessed with one of your employees and every day this individual shows up in the parking lot and is professing their love to one of your employees um, not making a threat of violence so to speak but making anyone in that position feel very uncomfortable very unsafe you know especially with someone invading their personal space 
Um, so, but without that threat of violence or actual violence, um, the employer likely wouldn't be successful under current law in um, applying for a restraining order to protect this employee. And the new supporters of this new law, um, they argued that employers and employees should not have to wait for conduct to escalate to violence before seeking um, court intervention. At that point, it's essentially too late. You've already you know, been attacked, you've already, something bad has probably already happened. So with this Senate Bill 428 um, being passed, it expands a lot to not only include um, violence and threats of violence, but also harassment. So um, of course, there's a definition for harassment under this new law. And what it is, um, it's defined as harassment is a knowing and willful course of conduct directed at specific person that seriously alarms, annoys or harasses the person and that serves no legitimate purpose. The course of conduct must be that which would cause a reasonable person to suffer substantial emotional distress and must actually cause substantial emotional distress. So in the scenario I just gave you before, clearly that would most likely fit into this definition of harassment and the employer under the new law, the new expansion would be able to successfully uh, apply for a restraining order to protect the employee from further harassment of this individual. Um, now this law actually does, although it's been passed, this law will not go into effect until January 1st of 2025. But since it is relevant um, to the workplace violence prevention plans that employers will be required to put into place this year, I definitely wanted to cover it and just let employers know what they're able to do as of 2024 and what they will additionally be able to do to protect their employees in 2025. Now, back to the workplace violence prevention plans that almost all employers will have to have now as of July 1st, 2024, who is covered? So it essentially ap applies to all employers and employees in the state of California with a few limited exceptions. Uh, the I will refer to the workplace violence prevention plan as the plan, or I'm going to try to because it's a mouthful, so I'm going to try to just shorten my um, wording here. The plan, it does not apply to workers who are teleworking from a location of the employee's choice or employers already regulated by existing standards for healthcare industries. And it also does not apply to work sites that have less than 10 employees present at any given time and that work site is not accessible to the public and the employer complies with the injury and illness prevention Cal OSHA regulation already. So if all those if those three items are met, then the work site may be exempt from the new law. So again, it's not just work sites with less than 10 employees, it's work sites with less than 10 employees present at any given time and that is not accessible to the public. Now, what is workplace, what's considered workplace violence under the plan? It's defined broadly, workplace violence is defined broadly as any act of violence or threat of violence that occurs in the place of employment. And the definition includes, uh, for example, verbal and written threats of violence and incidents involving, of course, um, weapons, use of a firearm, um, regardless of whether or not the employee was actually injured. And the definition also uh, includes some acts that uh, people uh, may think actually kind of waters down the meaning of workplace violence, such as a threat against an employee that results in a high likelihood um, resulting in injury, psychological trauma, or stress, regardless of whether the employee sustains an injury. So as you can see, that's very broad and it there, this means there's no reasonable person test uh, for this type of, you know, potential psychological trauma, um, stress, injury. The definition is subjective. And so a seemingly innocuous comment to someone uh, might be considered workplace violence based on the perception of the employee. So again, employers uh, will need to take note of this and just be aware, even if a reasonable person would have not found a comment to cause them 
stress or psychological trauma, but an employee comes to the employer and says, you know, employee A said this to me, I'm feeling very stressed. Even if, again, the employer does not feel a reasonable person would, would be caused stress, it doesn't matter. It's based on the perception of that employee. So that's important to be aware of going into these uh, workplace violence prevention plans. Again, I keep reminding, I keep saying over and over again, enforcement will begin July 1st, 2024. It doesn't mean that you can't have the, your plan in place already. And it definitely means your company should be working um, along with your legal counsel to prepare the workplace violence prevention plan now because it's detailed and it will take a significant amount of time to make sure that it's individually tailored to your particular company. Now, what should you include in the written um, workplace violence prevention plan? Well, first and foremost, the plan must be in writing and it must be easily accessible to the employees. As I said before, it can be included as a standalone, um, you know, its, its own plan, individual plan that you can disperse to employees, um, you know, electronically and also hard copy. Um, but it also can be included uh, in, the exist in an existing injury and illness prevention plan. So it's up to the company how they would like to do that. Um, but along with identifying the individuals responsible for implementing the plan at your particular place of work, the plan must also include um, the following. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just the highlights. It should include, or it must include rather, methods that the employer will use to implement the plan procedures to obtain the active involvement of the company's employees and authorized employee representatives in developing and implementing the plan, methods that the employer will use to coordinate implementation of the plan with other employers when that's applicable, um, depending on what type of, of business you run, um, also procedures for employer, um, how the employer will accept and respond to reports of workplace uh, violence, and also how they will work to prohibit retaliation against an employee who makes such a report. There will need to be procedures in place to ensure that supervisory and non-supervisory employees comply with that plan and, and are able to comply with that plan. Procedures with how to communicate with employees regarding workplace violence matters and how their reported matter will be investigated. That's very important. Employees will definitely want to understand that process. Um, there also needs to be a means to alert employees of the presence, the location and nature of a workplace violence emergency. So a threat, an imminent threat, you know, is occurring at the workplace. There needs to be um, a means to alert employees immediately um, so they can, you know, get to a safe place and take precautions. There needs to be evacuation and or sheltering plans. Also procedures for identifying workplace violence hazards and procedures um, to investigate and correct past incidents of workplace violence. So that's a lot. Again, it, like I said, it's going to be very comprehensive. Once you get it in place though, um, I suspect it'll be something that will be relatively uh, simple to you know, go over annually each year to modify and update as needed as you know, potentially um, things change within your own organization. But in addition to the work, the written workplace violence plan, employers also must keep a log of all workplace incidents. So the log must include um, the date, time, and location of any reported incident um, or, or incident, you know, that was observed, the workplace violent type, uh, you know, so specifically, um, was it an act of violence? Um, was it a threat? Um, a, just a detailed description overall of the incident and also uh, details just regarding who committed the act of violence. Was it a client, a customer? Was it a family or friend? Was it a coworker? Um, so again, all of that needs to be um, contained in the log. Um, a description of the circumstances at the time of the incident. So that would be specifically, you know, when the employee for example, was attacked? Were they completing usual job duties? Were they working in a poorly lit area, perhaps? Were they alone? Were other people there, um, etc. cetera? Um, also in the log, you want to include the type of incident. Um, so as I mentioned before, that could include physical attack without a weapon, 
Um, it could include a threat of physical force. It could include a sexual assault or a threat of sexual assault. Um, it could even include an animal attack. So really it's, it's extremely broad um, and you must be very detailed in documenting any um, reported uh, workplace violence incident. And lastly, you're gonna wanna make sure you include the consequences of the incident, um, which would include, you know, for example, whether law enforcement was contacted, um, was the individual taken away in an ambulance for medical care, um, and what actions were taken to protect um, the employee or employees from um, a further threat of violence. So now we went over the required written plan and the required log that must be maintained. Uh, the last piece of this is required employee training. So employees must be trained regarding the uh, new um, workplace violence prevention plan. So you'll definitely want, when you roll out the plan, that's when you'll want to schedule training for your employees this year. And so the training must be provided to all employees. Um, it should certainly cover the rules, requirements, definitions, and how to report incidents, that's all covered in your workplace violence prevention plan. Uh, it should cover um, workplace violence hazards that are specific to the employee's job, you know, if applicable, and associated corrective measures, um, discuss the incident log, and definitely give an opportunity for the employees um, for questions and, and answer period. So employees can, you know, if there's anything unclear, which would be very helpful to the employer too, so the employer may not have realized that a part of the plan is maybe a little bit difficult for the employees to understand, or there might need to be some modification or additional information provided. So it's good to have that time for employees to, um, for a Q&A. And lastly, employers will definitely need to maintain the records um, that are related to the incident log, um, the actual plan itself, training records, records of investigation, um, records of correction of any um, incident, etc. All of that will have to be maintained now for a period of five years. So whew, that is a lot. It is a big new obligation for California employers that is applicable to almost all likely employers in California now. So it's a big undertaking, um, but there is time to get all of that together. Um, July 1st will come fast, so get started now if you haven't already. And with that, um, next slide please, I'll move on to a different topic here. And that is uh, not surprising, now in 2024, um, effective as of the 1st of January, um, the California Fair Employment and Housing Act was amended, and with that amendment, um, employers are now um, prohibited from taking any adverse action, employment action, um, against their employees for off-duty, and I want to emphasize off-duty, off-duty marijuana use. So, uh, under this new amendment and this added protection now for employees, um, it will be unlawful for employers to discriminate based on um, a required drug screening. So specifically, what does that mean? It means employers are prohibited from using the results of hair or urine tests, for example, for marijuana, um, which can detect traces of cannabis um, potentially for days or weeks. So you cannot use that information to um, you know, in decisions to not for hiring, to penalize or discipline an employee, you no longer can can use that information for that. Um, employers can still test employees and potential employees for THC, the major psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, and that can indicate impairment. So um, the law stops employers from discriminating against employees if they test positive for non-psychoactive cannabis metabolites or metabolized THC that can be found in hair, blood, and urine, um, as these metabolites do not indicate impairment, only that the individual has consumed cannabis in the last you know, few days or weeks, potentially. So again, um, this is new. Um, employers are not prohibited from um, having their employees drug tested where appropriate and in compliance with the law, um, but 
certain results um, are now no longer going to be able to be used to you know, terminate, discipline, et cetera, employees because it um, if it go if it shows off duty cannabis use, essentially, um, employees are protected. Um, also, the expansion of FIHA prohibits employers from requesting information from their employees or job applicants relating to any uh, prior cannabis or current um, off duty cannabis use. Um, also, employers cannot use any information they may have obtained through a background check, for example, relating to a person's criminal history related to cannabis use. So that's another um, change that employers need to be aware of, particularly in light of hiring potential employees. Next slide, please. So I'm sure employers are wondering, my goodness, what can I do? Employees can come to work uh, high? No, 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 no. Employer, the, the expansion does not permit an employee to possess, be impaired by, or use cannabis, marijuana on the job. So um, employers, it does not impact um, employers' rights to maintain a drug and alcohol-free workplace. That is still well within the employer's rights. An impaired employee is maybe you know, disciplined up to termination. Um, so really the purpose of this new law is to protect most workers you know, in California unless they fall into an exception, but employees who use cannabis, marijuana off the clock. But of course, employers must still um, and are allowed to maintain a drug-free, safe workplace for their customers, employees. Okay, well, with that, thank you very much. I know I covered a lot. I will go ahead and turn over to my colleague, Deanna Maxfield. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks again to everyone for being here. I'm going to talk about a few updates to California law regarding leave and compensation. Uh, the first update is the expansion of paid sick leave. You are probably already aware that California does have a requirement for employees to receive paid sick leave. That's been around for a while. The difference is that starting January 1st, 2024, the requirement is now five days of paid sick leave per year. It was previously three days. So you will need to update your leave policies accordingly. It's defined as either five days or 40 working hours of paid sick leave per year. You can provide that leave in one of two ways, either accrual or upfront. Accrual means that the employee accrues leave as they work and they need to accrue at least one hour of paid sick time per 30 hours worked. The upfront method means that you just provide each employee with a bank of five days of sick leave at the beginning of each year. And you can do that at the beginning of each calendar year, but of course, uh, not all employees start working on January 1st. So if you have someone who joins partway through the year, you just need to make sure that you provide them with prorated leave so that they're still, so that you're still complying with the amount requirements. You can still use a combined PTO system. I know a lot of employers lump vacation and sick time together. That's still fine. You just need to make sure that you're still providing the minimum amount of leave to be compliant with the law. Once the employee has the sick leave, they must be permitted to use it for diagnosis or treatment of a medical condition of themselves or a family member. So this includes the employee themselves getting sick or their kid is sick and they need to take them to the doctor. They need to be able to use their paid leave for that as well. There's also one more category of usage. Victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking must be allowed to use their time to seek medical treatment, which they'd be allowed to anyway but they also must be allowed to use their time to receive other services related to the stalking or abuse or whatever they're experiencing or to go to court. So if they need to 
appear in court to ask for a restraining order against someone, they need to be able to use this paid sick leave to do that. Of course, since this is a requirement, employees are prohibited from retaliating against an employee for using their paid sick leave. This includes, I know some employers have attendance systems where someone gets a, a point or an occurrence for an unplanned absence. If someone needs to use their paid sick leave last minute, you know, they need to go to the ER, for example, um, you can't penalize them at all. So they can't receive a point or an occurrence for that absence. And something that I want to make sure to mention about this law um, that's a little maybe surprising is that it doesn't have any provision for asking for medical documentation. I understand it seems natural that if someone's taking sick leave, you can ask for a doctor's note, but that's not the case necessarily. Uh, this law does not have that provision and it's not entirely clear how that's gonna be interpreted, but the safest thing to do is to not ask for documentation. Hopefully that's not a big problem because it's only five days a year, but if you are having an issue with an employee, of course, contact legal counsel. Next slide, please. The next law I'm gonna talk about is bereavement leave for reproductive loss. California has required employers to provide bereavement leave for a while for the loss of a family member. This is modeled on that law, but it allows for leave for reproductive losses. The requirement is up to five days of bereavement leave per incident. The law has several examples of reproductive loss, including miscarriage, failed adoption, failed surrogacy, stillbirth, or unsuccessful assisted reproduction. Unlike the paid sick leave, this leave does not need to be paid. However, if an employee does have paid sick time or vacation time that they want to use to cover their absence so they don't miss out on pay, they do need to be allowed to use it. But you don't have to in addition, allow them paid bereavement leave. It doesn't need to be taken all at once. The employee can take it intermittently within three months of the loss. And similar to the paid sick leave law we just discussed, this law does not have a provision that allows the employer to ask for documentation, which is actually unlike the other bereavement leave law that law says that you can ask for an obituary or some other kind of evidence that a loss actually happened. Under the reproductive loss law, there is no such provision. Provision, So you're not going to want to ask for any uh, documentation lest you be accused of not complying with this law. Obviously, some employees will volunteer information about what's happened or health information that in information needs to be kept confidential. Obviously, health information should always be kept confidential, but this law also has a specific requirement that anything the employee tells management or HR about their need for this leave needs to be kept confidential by the employer. Next slide, please. So here's another change. Um, as you likely know, the California minimum wage has been increasing for a while. Beginning January 1st, that increased from $15.50 an hour to $16 an hour. Something that some employers may miss is that this also increases the minimum salary for exempt employees. So if you have an employee who you're considering exempt from overtime, so they're not being paid extra for overtime that they work. They need to meet what we call the job duties test. They have to be in a category of job that qualifies for the exemption, but they also need to be paid at least $66,560 a year. That's the minimum salary for them to qualify as exempt. And that's basically that's two, twice the minimum wage for the whole year. 
So now is a good time to double check that your employee's compensation is compliant with all of those rules. We also want to mention that the California minimum wage is a statewide floor. So everyone in California needs to be paid at least $16 an hour, but individual cities and counties can require a higher minimum wage. And in fact, there are at least 35 or 40 local governments in California that do have higher minimum wages. So make sure to check your local laws or consult with local counsel. Next slide, please. And finally, since we're talking about compensation, I did want to mention that the Department of Industrial Relations has updated the wage theft notice that is required to be provided to employees. This form probably looks familiar because you've probably been using it, but the DIR has released a new version that you can download on their website. It's got some additional notices about the Paid Sick Leave Act and uh, some emergency and disaster information. You don't need to distribute the new version of the form to all of your employees unless there's some kind of change in their compensation. It's just that next time you use this form, which needs to be provided on hire or seven days after a change in compensation, you should use the new version of the form. So just uh, look out for that next time you need to use this. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Audrey and Marissa. All right. Great. Thank you, Deanna. I appreciate that. Great job. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Audrey G, and I have my associate here, Marissa Boyd. We are from Brown G and Wenger. We are business law attorneys. And Marissa and I actually practice employment law or HR law. and It's on the employer side. And so we do both litigation as well as class action and pocket defense, wage and hour issues, trade secrets, discrimination, harassment, all of those sorts of types of litigation as well as the front-end compliance work in terms of architecting policies or strategic moves that you might have with your workforce. So Angela and her team have provided you with this great legislative update, and we're going to go ahead and do kind of a case law roundup of all the cases that happened, not all, but some of the notable cases that happened in 2023. So um, next slide, please. Um, you know, COVID happened, right? Oh my gosh, that was just like a few years ago, and it's almost like we're putting it in our you know, back there and we can't remember it, but it's like, we're finally seeing some of the litigation that came out of the early COVID era, you know, and it's, and they're winding our way through the courts. And one of the issues that we were wrestling with at the time, and we're just like, oh, what is the duty here? Um, legally, you know, what kind of duty does an employer have to take into consideration their employees' family members and their family members' health um, and what obligations an employer have to protect those employees' family members um, from COVID. And can you, as an employer, be sued by your employee um, who got COVID at the workplace and giving it to the family members? And can that family member then sue you if you acted where you knew that you were putting the employee into a high-risk situation? Well, we got some some answers here, finally, years later, um, and it's the Kusiemba versus Victory Woodworks case, um, and that addressed that issue. It, was, it went up on both, interestingly, state and federal courts, and we got decisions at both the Ninth Circuit level as well as the California Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court clarified that the employees owe no duty of care whew, under state tort law to non-employees, including those employees' family members, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Well, what happened is Mr. Kusiemba had worked for the Woodworks company in San Francisco. He got COVID at work. The company was had supposedly exposed him by transferring a bunch of workers at another job site who had kind of high incidence of COVID to his job site. Well, then he brought it, he got it at work, brought it home to his wife. 
his wife was in a particularly vulnerable state, ended up in the hospital for more than a month. Um, there was a bunch of legal wrangling at the state and federal court involved with workers' compensation law. And ultimately, it was found that the employer had no duty of care to prevent the spread of COVID to those household, household members, either the spouse or the children. And notably, thankfully, the California Supreme Court acknowledged that there's only so much an employer can do to prevent the spread of viruses such as COVID-19. Employers have little to no control over the safety precautions taken by their employees or their household members outside of the workplace. And they cannot control whether that individual employees comply with precautions such as mask wearing or social distancing. So this case should just make you rest a little bit easier knowing that you don't have to change your job staffing plans to account for how it might affect your employee's family member's health. Whew. Okay, moving on. Sequoia, Rossi versus Sequoia Elementary School. So that was a school district case um, where it was also involving COVID issues. And there was a state public health order that came down which said that it required schools to verify the COVID vaccination status of all of their employees and require proof of vaccination or weekly testing. Remember those days? Well, what do you do if you have an employee who refuses to give proof of their vaccination um, status? And in this case, the employee, Mrs. Rossi, refused to show proof of vaccination status or undergo the weekly testing. So the school said, well, maybe why don't you go ahead and go remote? And she said, nope, I don't want to do that. I can't do my job that way. So the school then terminated her um, for not complying with its test or vaccinate requirement. So guess what? Yep, that's right. The employee sued under the Confidential a Medical Information Act for alleged discrimination based on her refusal to authorize release of her confidential medical information and for unauthorized use of the medical information. Well, the Court of Appeal found that actually what the school district did was correct. They found that complying with the lawful order of a state public health officer shielded the employer from liability as a matter of law. So Rossi was about a public school district, but I think it's still instructive here. The takeaway is if you're going to be, you as the employer are going to be complying with the lawful order, which requires texting or vaccination, then there's a good argument that you should be protected under the Rossi thought. All right, moving along. Out okay. there, particularly when there's a public health order in, in effect. And I think that was important. Yes. So, um, you know, that was during COVID times. I, I'm less certain that would be the case now, but, you know, right. instructive nonetheless. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Ex exactly. That there was a public health order. Um, okay. Moving along. So there's payout uh, for your accrued vacation when you're going to furlough people. So remember, again, at the beginning of this whole COVID thing, we weren't quite sure what the world was going to happen, what, what was going to happen. Um, and so in that particular case, in 2020, when the pandemic hit hotels and, you know, we were kind of seeing that like decline in room rates, Hyatt um, decided to temporarily lay off its employees in March of 2020 to accommodate, you know, a projected slowdown in its business. So the company had no return to work date, but it said that it had hoped to have its employees back in eight to 12 weeks. They continued to pay the health benefits in April and May, but then later in June, they're like, so sorry, we're going to just go ahead and terminate you. Um, and then at that point in time, Hyatt then paid the accrued unused vacation. Well, an employee filed a class action and pocket case, and the court looked at some of opinion letters from the DLSE and base, and as well as their interp interpretations manual, and said that if an employee is laid off without a specific return to date, return to work date within a normal pay period, the employer must issue its final paycheck. So the takeaway is if you're going to go ahead and implement a furlough or a temporary shutdown and you're not giving like a, 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 cert, a date certain of a return to work, then you really should treat it as if it's a termination. All of that paperwork that goes along with it, including paying out all of their accrued unused PTO or vacation. So that's the Hartstein versus Hyatt matter. All right, next slide, Marissa, you're up. So somewhat relatedly, um, the next batch of cases we have relate to workplace discrimination. Um, and the first kind of takeaway relates to religious accommodation requests. And remember, 
employers are required not only to accommodate their employees' disabilities, but also their religious beliefs. Um, so in Groff, for example, the employee refused to work on Sundays because of his evangelical religious beliefs. Um, and in a significant shift from the prior de minimis standard, um, employers are now required to grant a religious accommodation unless they can show that doing so would, quote, results in a substantial increased costs in release in relation to the conduct of its particular business. So for the example, the Supreme Court there noted that being forced to pay other employees overtime would not constitute an undue hardship. Um, but instead, employers are required to consider other options like voluntary shift swapping. So this really just goes to show that if you are going to deny um, a religious accommodation or request, you need to be able to prove up that um, certain costs would result and not just, you know, small costs, but like really kind of substantial um, in regards to the nature of your business. And so. Marissa, also in the in this particular case, um, it came up, I think we'd gotten a lot of questions during COVID, right, in terms of religious accommodation. And if people were asking for a religious accommodation in order to not test or vaccinate or those sorts of things. So I think it's just a, a trigger now for you all employers to think, ooh, you know, maybe we should look at this a little bit harder. Maybe we want to make sure that we're being able to have evidence to prove up that substantial increased costs. Yeah. And, um, you know, for example, it's a good point, like uh, animosity towards the accommodation by other employees wouldn't be sufficient to deny an accommodation either. So, you know, some some employees might be resentful of the accommodation on a religious basis and that, you know, because it's was kind of a hot button issue, right? Um, and that wouldn't in and of itself be sufficient to deny the accommodation. So that's a, that's a good point. Um, the second takeaway relates to playing music at work. <laughs> Essentially, don't don't play sexually graphic or misogynistic music, just, just don't do it. Um, there's lots of other musical genres out there. <laughs> um, this is also a reminder that um, harassment doesn't need to be directed at a particular person. Um, in order to pollute a workplace and give rise to a discrimination claim. And it doesn't matter if both genders are offended because in that case, um, the music was just like violent and sexually graphic and you know, men and women were both offended. Um, and so you do need to make sure that you're carefully monitoring your workplace for images, displays, audio recordings, music, um, just to make sure that you're not exposed to those kind of hostile looking. Yeah. And uh, I think it comes up oftentimes when you have warehouses. So maybe extra training with some of your supervisors in terms of normally they might be like, oh, you know, my employees can go ahead and play whatever music kind of gets them going and makes the line go faster and things like that. Just like check in with them and make sure that they're actually really looking at what music is being played and some of the lyrics that are actually being or posters. Said. Yeah. 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 Um, and finally, this is your yearly reminder to make sure your sexual harassment policies and trainings are up to date. Um, under the FIHA, employers can be strictly liable for sex harassment by a supervisor, but, and this is the key point here, only if the supervisor is acting in capacity of, as a supervisor when the harassment occurs. So for example, in Atala, the employer was not liable for sexual harassment when one of its managers sent a sexually explicit photo to his employee, but it was only because the supervisor and the employee had a texting relationship that predated her employment. They really were close friends. They went to each other's birthday parties. They spent holidays together. Um, they texted on non-work related things and the text occurred, you know, on 10 p.m. on a Friday. Um, so way outside the, the work period. Um, this is a pretty murky area and one that's becoming more top of mind with the Me Too movement. So I really think it behooves all employers and supervisors to have this strong kind of top down employment environment that makes it clear that this behavior will not be tolerated. So next slide. All right, great. Okay, moving on to the wage and hour bucket of all sorts of goodies that we have. Um, the first case, the tie versus IBM, so we all, it's, it has to do with work from home expenses, right? And the pandemic happened, everyone was sent home. What do you do? So we know under Labor Code 2802, you, the employer, have to indemnify your employees for all necessary expenditures and losses incurred by your employees when they are, perform their duties. Those are the reasonable and necessary expenditures. Once again, following on the heels of pandemic, and the remote work from home, what obligations do employers have to reimburse their employees from work from home expenses? Well, here, Ty was an employee who worked from home and who met and who required internet access, a computer, a telephone headset to perform his job duties. Well, IBM had provided all of these things to its employees when they worked in the office, but when COVID hit and IBM sent all of its employees home to work remotely, Ty alleged that he had to pay for all of these items 
on his own nickel and that IBM didn't reimburse him. So guess what? Oh yeah, right, class and Paga lawsuit. And IBM argued that they didn't require their employees to work from home and it was the public health orders, right? Just kind of passing the buck over there and the government mandated shutdown. Um, and the court said, well, those public health orders did not create an exception to the labor code obligation for the employers to reimburse their expenses. So guess what employer you need to pay for those expenses. The takeaway, and your remote work policies, look at your remote work and telecommuting policies. And if you're requiring your employees to work remotely, you should reimburse them for those reasonable expenses that are necessary for them to do their job. Or, of course, you're always going to be thinking about your ADA and disability requirements as well. Um, the employer is obligated to reimburse the employee's work from home expenses, regardless of whether the employer directed the employee to incur those that specific expense. Um, this is really important too, because I think in that case, they didn't know that they had you know, they didn't ask him to accrue the expense and they still were kind of on the hook for it. So yes, yes, thank you. Um, and then there's there's also the other way we get this question a lot. We got this question a lot when this was all happening. And you're like, well, what if I have my office, which is open, and you have the desk and the internet and all of the things that the employee needs, but the, the employee wants to work at home, and it's for the employee's benefit. Well, in that case, there's good arguments that you wouldn't have to, that the employer wouldn't have to pay for those expenses, because it's providing the opportunity to work remotely at home, but also still provides the opportunity to work with all of the things things that the employee needs to do their job in the office. Um, there is some gray area, of course, if the employee needs to have his phone or the internet to be able to do the work. And then we talked before, like years before, on the Swan case, um, where they you, you, you must reimburse employees for a reasonable percentage of what their employees cost. So anyways, Pay your employees' expenses. If you have some questions, give us a call. Um, the next case is no rounding. Oh, this really shouldn't be a surprise. It's the Word Woodworth versus Loma Linda University Medical Center. Because um, remember, last year we talked about Donahue, and that said that you can't round meal periods. And then we also talked about Camp versus Home Depot, where it says the employers are not permitted to round when they can capture and have, in fact, captured the exact amount of time an employee had worked during a shift. Because remember, in that case, they rounded to the next quarter of an hour, 15 minutes kind of big bad amount of time. Well, this year again, no surprise, um, the court reminded employers that in this day and age, when we have the technology to run time clocks down to the minute or even the second, you really shouldn't be rounding up or rounding down your time punches, even neutral rounding. Um, and when I say neutral rounding, that means that sometimes you round up, sometimes you round down, but in the whole, it kind of balances out so it's fair for both the employer and the employee. Because remember, the courts had allowed uh, rounding in a limited manner so long it was the rounding was lawful and neutrally applied. This was the 2012 C's Candies case. And that this case clarified that you actually should not be rounding um, and that the C's instruction for neutral rounding is really kind of going by the highway and being rejected. Take the take home on this pay for all hours that your employees work, that they are like writing down on their timesheets or that they're recording in their time clocks, right? Don't use rounding policies. Implement some sort of time capture method so that you're, based, you're paying based on the actual time punches. Um, this case is also notable notable for kind of wonky litigation strategy um, and that pocket actions should not actually be stricken because they are unmanageable. That comes later if you actually get sued. Hopefully that will never happen. Um, but again, this case is on is on um, this at the Supreme Court level. So we'll find out how it happens. Um, another case that we just noted is the Helix Energy versus Hewitt case. I'll kind of skip over that. I think the takeaway, there's some FLISA issues, not specifically California, but we flagged it because it was a really highly paid compensated employee at 200,000 an hour, 2000, I'm sorry, $200,000 a year. But guess what? He was supposed to be paid overtime. So at that high rate, it was like a pretty big chunk of change as well as attorney's fees. So just think about your classifications of your employees and make sure that you're doing it right. Um, we're seeing the Naranjo case again. That's been up and down through the courts over the last few years. 
Um, but when this case came out in February of 2023, it looked like it was an employer victory in the world of wage and hour penalties. It's now on review at the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court. And if it upheld, then the case will make plaintiff's attorneys work a whole lot harder to recover their penalties against employers. So remember, in that case, the employee had brought labor code violations arising out of meal and rest break premium pay obligations, which then triggered the uh, wage statement penalties and attorney's fees. And importantly, the court held that they, if the employer could show that it had a good faith belief that the employer was paying the employees correctly, then the employer could defeat those penalties, the imposition of those penalties, since the employer's failure to provide a correct wage statement did not meet the standard of knowing and intentional uh, that's set forth in Labor Code 226. In other words, a good faith dispute on compliance with the accurate wage statement provides you with a defense. Um, remember, Labor Code 226 is that you got to provide accurate wage statements, got to have wages, hours work, deductions, all of those sorts of things. And if you don't, then there's penalties. It's $50, $50 for the initial, and then it just kind of like goes higher from there, $100 per employee. So what happens, what happens if you, the employer, have a good faith belief that maybe you've classified your employees correctly and they're not independent contractors? What happens if you get the raw law wrong? Well, the law wrong. Well, this case allowed you some space for being able to do what you thought was the right thing. Um, but now it's up on um, being taken up by the California Supreme Court. So we're waiting to see if we will still have that defense available to us. All right, next slide. Marissa, it's you. So we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to breeze through this one. Um, but essentially, I'm sure you recall that there's an ABC test, um, which is pretty strict to me if you want to be classify your workers as an independent contractor. Um, this case have held the constitutionality of the exemption for certain types of fina financial professionals, um, which importantly does not mean that just because you're a financial professional, you're automatically um, an independent contractor. What it does mean is that you apply a more lenient test. So um, if you are going to be utilizing, you know, um, independent contractors, you might want to talk to um, an employee attorney because there are a lot of these kind of niche exemptions. Next slide. Marissa, is this you? Uh, no, it's you. Oh, I did not know that. All right. Then we have, um, there were a few cases with regards to agency and alter ego that came down. Um, they're noted here. And I think the thing that you want to want to pay attention to is there was this new joint employer rule that came out from the NLRB um, and it expanded the idea of, or it seemingly expanded the idea of who could be a joint employer. So there was a whole bunch of kind of hubbubaloo um, in the temporary staffing agencies um, and some of your, so you might have PEOs, you might have temporary staffing, you might have other um, partners that you work with uh, where those partners say that they are actually um, you know, like the employer of record. Well, actually the case law before had been both of you both of you, the employer, the actual employer, as well as that joint staffing agency had some joint employer liability. The new NLRB uh, ruling which came down made that more clear. So I think it's just, it's one of those things that you should just keep in mind that even, and, and also in your agreements with your staffing agencies, there's often an indemnity clause and a mutual indemnity clause so that both of you indemnify their mirror, that both of you indemnify the other um, for things that happen within your scope. So at some point in time, if you all get sued for whatever it is, the violations, there's going to be another co-defendant in there. But it certainly had a lot of um, staffing agencies uh, kind of up, up in arms. All right, next slide. Okay, so everybody's favorite California class action alternative, the Private Attorney General's Act, or PAGA. Um, you might recall that in 2022, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, kind of made this distinction between individual PAGA claims, which are brought on behalf of the employee's own individual harm that they suffered, and their representative claims, which are brought on behalf of other aggrieved employees on behalf of the state. Um, the California Supreme Court kind of broke away from the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling a little bit. Um, they found that they weren't bound by the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of California law and said that just because you have these individual 
and representative claims doesn't mean that the representative claims go away if the individual claims get brought to arbitration. So in other words, they kind of proceed um, parallelly, but it did provide kind of a roadmap for employers who are defending against these kind of claims. Um, step one would be to enforce the arbitration agreement. Um, step two would be to ask the court to exercise its discretion and note that it's discretion and not mandatory like the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court had held um, to stay the individual, um, the non-individual arbitrary claims. And then three, if you beat the plaintiff in the arbitration, um, you can prevent the plaintiff from then bringing the POGA claims in the court action. So that's kind of the roadmap. Um, the second case kind of pertains to that step one, which is enforcement of the arbitration agreement. Um, and specifically, employers need to make sure that the agreement permits the arbitration, the carve out of those individual claims. Um, so, for example, in Duran, the agreement included a carve out provision stating that all claims under PAGA are not arbitrable under this agreement. And the court took that to mean both the individual and non-individual um, claims. This is kind of nuanced. <laughs> so I would recommend that you um, talk to an employer, employment attorney, um, and really take a close look at those arbitration agreements. And given the way that the law is changing, I really would recommend like a yearly review and update. Next slide. I was on mute. There we go. All right. So um, the Castello case. Um, so if, if any of you had been using severance agreements and you had departing employees um, who were good employees, and then for whatever reason, either they were giving you notice or that you were giving them notice. So they're staying on. And, and, and even though you know that they're going to be leaving you. They're going to be leaving you within a month, six weeks, two months, something like that. So in those cases, what often happens is that you'll have a severance agreement that you'll offer to them um, and that they have some period of time to sign it, whether that's 21 days or 45 days, if you have a release of age claims and are trying to comply with the Older Workers Benefits Protection Act. But the idea, big picture, is that they sign it at one point in time and then at the very end of their employment, Employment, they're supposed to sign it again. So it's like this two-part, two-release um, step. And so what happens in this Castella case is the employer screwed up. They like, oh, they, the employee only signed it once and on the earlier time. Um, and so you should be looking at your severance agreements and saying, oh, well, maybe I might have some saving grace out there. Um, so essentially in Costello, again, it was similar to the ones that has been used by many employers when they have a future termination employee, a future termination date with a good employee that they trust and want to keep around for the next month or so, but they want to lock down that release immediately, right? For all the things that once you sign it, you look backwards and you're released from all the things that had that went up to that point in time. Um, but in terms of the future stuff, that's that was kind of an issue and that's not released. Um, and so you want to go ahead and get that initial release and then lock that down before any of those friendly, friendly, super nice sentiments like change in that like next month or so. Um, so again, there's supposed to be that first one that's signed and then there's the second one. Um, the employee tripped up uh, and the company tripped up and only signed that first release, signed both releases the earlier time. Um, and in that particular case, the employee actually took the money, um, the severance money, and then turned around and then sued the employer shockingly. Uh, and then it went up and it went to arbitration and then went back to court. Um, but basically, they said since the employee knew about the age claim um, uh, obligations at the time that they signed the release, even the second release, even though it was talking about earlier future claims, that it was still good and enforceable. So again, takeaways, if you have and use these two-part releases, make sure you do them correctly in terms of one right now and then one on the last day of employment. But if you don't and it gets all messed up, don't just like, you know, throw in the towel. You might have some saving grace, though. So it's really fact-dependent. You need to check in with legal counsel there. Mm -hmm. Next slide. <laughs> Finally, we have um, a couple of cases related to arbitration. Um, the first is a reminder that under a law passed in 2019, if the party that drafted an arbitration agreement, which is, again, almost always the employer, um, fails to pay the arbitration fees and costs within, quote, 30 days after the due date, um, that drafting party waives the right to compel arbitration. So this means that the arbitrator has to have their money in their hands um, within that 30-day deadline. 
So in that case, they had mailed the check on September 30th. It was due on October 3rd and the arbitrator received it on October 5th and the court said, nah, too bad. Um, so really what you should be doing um, when you get that invoice is to pay it as soon as possible if you're gonna mail it or even better, try to use a faster form of payment like credit cards, electronic checks, wire transfers, that kind of thing, um, particularly if you're cutting it close to the deadline. And the second case, Bonta, we've talked about um, before, but essentially it's a right affirmation from the Ninth Circuit that California employers are permitted to include mandatory arbitration provisions as a condition of employment um, where the FAA applies the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, with certain exceptions, of course, they still need to be procedurally and substantively fair. Um, Pre-dispute sexual harassment and assault arbitration waivers are enforceable. They need to comply with those PAGA waivers we had talked about earlier. Um, again, this is just kind of goes to show that um, those arbitration agreements probably should be up to date and reviewed kind of yearly. So that's all I have for you. All right. Um, I have one more comment, actually. Um, there In the new laws, there was one law, um, there's actually a couple laws related to non-competes, um, and that's Senate Bill 699, as well as Assembly Bill AB 1076. Um, and we all know that in California, non-competes are, you know, those are unenforceable. But as it turns out, there are there were some employers, sometimes they're out of state or whatnot, or sometimes they're in California and they knew better, but they would throw it in anyways with regards to their um, employment agreements or other documents that the employer would have their employee sign. And they'd say, oh, well, if it's unenforceable, it'll just be unenforceable, but I might as well just kind of have the employee sign it. Well, you can't do that anymore. And in fact, there is a deadline um, of February 14th or 15th. It's like coming up in the next two weeks. Um, and basically, if you do that sort of, you, you have to tell all of your current employees and your former employees that if you had any of those sorts of, of agreements, th those are void and unenforceable. Um, so there's actually a notice requirement. And then if you do those sorts of things, then there's all sorts of possible penalties, attorney's fees. The employees could sue you for those sorts of things, for injunctions in a civil action, um, recoup any sort of damages. So it's just really important that you don't include any sort of non-competes. There is a lot of hammers, which is coming down with the new law. Um, you still can protect your trade secrets. And so that's fine. So if you say, if you happen to say that your employee is, you know, can't compete with you, by not stealing your trade secrets, you that's still okay. But you just can't have a bare non-compete and think that you're going to get away with it. So yeah, and you do need to be careful non when drafting those um, trade secret provisions to make sure that they're kind of narrowly tailored because if the trade secret restriction rises to the level of a non-compete, um, then as Audrey's saying now, now employees have their own cause of action. They have their new new right to bring a lawsuit against you for even kind of proposing that. So it, it really is a, a significant hammer. So um, right avoid it. <laughs> yeah, I think the gray area, Marissa, that's a good point. The gray area on that one is if it says that you can't compete with us using our confidential information and confidential information is then defined somewhere else to include, oh, all prospective um, customers and clients and things like that. So then that becomes a problem. So yeah, those things can be protectable, but it really depends on the situation. So if you're going to try to um, restrict that kind of information, you really should be talking to an employment uh, attorney to draft that clause very carefully. All right, I know we're at time, so. Ah, no worries, this is, that is such a complicated topic. We, um, so thank you everybody. We are going to move into question and answers. I hope everybody knows this is scheduled to go until 1.15. So we're going to, and thank you for submitting so many questions. We are very um, happy to answer these. What I'm going to do is go down the list of questions, take them in order. And the first few I would uh, give to Lindsay Meyer. So the first one is, uh, when is the employer required to provide notices in other languages such as Spanish? And Lindsay, why don't you take this one and then just keep going um, okay. until we get to the ones. Okay, great. Um, I will try to answer this as quickly as possible. So in California, um, the law requires that uh, certain policies must be translated into another language if 10% or more of your workforce speaks a language other than English. Um, those policies include, um, at a minimum, policies against harassment, discrimination, retaliation, including investigation and complaint procedures. It also includes family and medical leave, so FMLA, as well as 
CIFRA, um, so as applicable, depending on which one or if both apply to your individual um, workplace, and then reasonable accommodations for employees um, disabled by pregnancy, um, pregnancy disability leave or transfer. So even though the law requires certain um, areas to be translated, if 10% or more of your workforce speaks a language other than English, really, I strongly recommend um, that policies, especially um, policies such as at will employment, um, explanations of mill and rest breaks, uh, reasonable accommodations, etc. All of that also be translated. Um, because, as you know, in handbooks, generally, there's a final page where the employer employee acknowledges, you know, all the policies and procedures of the handbook. And if you have an employee who is a limited English speaker, it's not going to do you a lot of good that they've acknowledged that they've read and understood, um, you know, the policies and procedures of your place of business when you clearly know they they don't under, have a you know a, a fluent grasp of the Eng English language. So again, while there are certain um, areas that must be translated, if ten percent or more of your workforce speaks a language other than English, I uh, we strongly recommend um, that the employer do um, translate for employees who have limited English speaking, just because there could be liability and exposure on behalf of the employer um, to the employee. If, you know, for example, something happens um, where the employee is injured in the workplace or they're being harassed and they come back and say, well, I couldn't understand the policies, you know, that were in place to protect me because you never gave me it translated into, you know, my not my you know, first language. So again, um, it's a little complicated <laughs> as everything usually is in California. So if you have any other questions or you want to clarify on that, please reach out. And Lindsay, uh, just to interject, like yeah. we've litigated that issue on unconscionability of arbitration agreements in federal court. Um, we've seen it in state court as well. So it's arbitration agreements, handbooks, like you pointed out, all of those kind of key ones. Um, anyways, nice. just thought I'd put it in. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, so definitely recommended, not per se required in every instance, but really re strongly recommended. Um, so next question here is, what if I don't have a workplace violence prevention plan in place by the deadline? So um, that the deadline again is July 1st, 2024. So there are potential penalties. Cal, you know, this is brand new being rolled out, so we're not sure how Cal OSHA necessarily is going to um, enforce, but um, what they're saying is they will enforce the new law through its standard inspection, citation, and penalty um, framework that they have in place already, and depending on the nature of the violation, um, penalties could climb as high as around $25,000, I believe, for violations that are classified as serious, and they could go over $150,000 for violations that are classified as willful. And Kalosha um, will also require employers deemed to be out of compliance um, to abate alleged violations to Cal Ocean satisfaction, and potentially that will include changes to the employer's um, policies and procedures. So again, it's really important to make sure that you're in compliance by the deadline. And this is something I really would recommend um, not to try to do on your own, or if you do take a stab at it and doing it on your own, definitely have your legal counsel review it and revise it for you. Um, you will be saving yourself a lot of uh, potential stress and heartache down the road. I guarantee you that. I just um, wanted to chime in, Lindsay. Sure. Thank you. Um, we have a client that was, um, they, they had an employee that was being threatened um, and in a precarious situation. And so we recommended doing the workplace violence prevention um, plan ahead of time, just so that it was in place. Lindsay actually worked on it so that they would be protected if anything happened. And it was just a best practices in, a, in an abundance of caution. And we're advising clients of that now. Like if you see something coming down the road and you think there might be a threat to one of your employees, it's best to just go ahead and do it now. So sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to mention that. No, no. Um, thank you, Angela. Okay, let's see, uh, moving right along. Um, can we prohibit employees from using 
um, I believe it's um, marijuana on their brakes. It's awful when they come back reeking of weed, very unprofessional. Yes, I agree that, <laughs> um, and, and yes, um, the expansion of uh, FIHA does not prevent employers from um, you know keeping a drug free uh, working environment. So certainly, if someone has you know a ten minute break and they're you know smoking marijuana, they're going to come back impaired. So you are allowed to keep your employees um, or like to discipline employees if they are impaired on the job, and you're allowed to maintain and, and should be maintaining a drug free alcohol free work um, environment. And if you have any questions, just because this law is new, before you just go straight down the path of, of disciplining or terminating somebody, um, reach out to your legal counsel because you want to make sure that you're not uh, accidentally stepping into an area where you could be, you know, potentially exposing your your company to liability. Lindsay, what do you think about parking lots, like right outside the employees employer's business? Well, I, I suppose, you know, where you are makes a slight bit of difference as far as um are you violating the the policy but if you're coming back right after you're going to be impaired so i believe that the expansion of the law would still provide um employers the ability to you know enforce that drug-free working environment now are legally are they going to get in trouble by you know by smoking on a public property you know that's not, I, I think that's not in the purview of the employer per se, but it's just what can the employer do? Let's see here. Angela, is there another one we have for us? Um, let's see. I think, where were we? Um... Oh, here's another one. I think yes. this is similar to what Audrey just asked. Can I discipline my employee if I found out the employee has marijuana on their person at work, even if they're not using in the workplace? Again, yes, because you're allowed to keep it, maintain a drug free um, working environment. Employees can't be impaired. So even if they go off the work site and become impaired and come back in, most certainly you can still enforce your policies and procedures. Um, so, yes, like, again, you can't control necessarily what your employee is doing on their lunch break because they're completely off duty. But if they come back drunk to work, you would be able to, again, follow your regular um, policies and procedures for implementing discipline in that instance. Okay. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I yeah. think, you know, we're at the 115 mark. Um, if anyone needs to drop off, you can, but we'll keep going. There's a lot of questions and I think the okay. answers will be really helpful and enlightening. So the next one is from David Copeland. It says, is that sick leave the same for part-time employees? And I'll give this to Deanna. Sure. Um, so the paid sick leave law applies to all employees, including part-time employees. Um, the law is not very specific about how part-time employees are treated, but it does say that if you allow an employee to accrue one hour of paid leave time for every 30 hours worked, that then you're in compliance. So if you have a lot of part-time employees, that may influence your decision about using the accrual versus upfront method, because the upfront method says you must provide a bank of five days, but the accrual method allows for that one, it's tied to the hours worked. So potentially a part-time employee is going to accrue less than 40 hours over the course of a year. You do have to let the accrued sick time carry over to the following year though. It's not a, it can't be a use it or lose it situation. Great. And then the next one, um, let's see, the, the next one is, do I have to give an employee this leave as soon as they start working? They have to accrue it right away from day one of employment, but an employer is permitted to have a rule that the employee needs to be working for 90 days before they're allowed to use it. So that bank needs to accrue, but you can say you're not allowed to use the time until after your 90th day. Great. Thank you. And the last one for you, or actually the last two, who is a family member is the first one. 
Um, so I think that probably refers to the paid sick leave law because right. you can use it for helping a family member. Right. There's a list in the law. It's uh, a parent, child, spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparent, grandchild, sibling, or designated person. Um, the employee, if they have, you know, a non-traditional family connection, they can designate a person that they're going to take sick leave for. You can limit the, you can make it so that the employee doesn't get to designate a new person every time they ask for sick leave. You can say um, for each 12 month period, you only get one designated person. Okay, I, I'm going to go to the next one. And then I think the others are probably for Audrey's team. I do see some down below that ask about a workplace violent prevention program um, template. We would be happy to talk to you about that. We don't recommend templates um, for employers, but we certainly would be happy to talk to you about um, preparing, helping you prepare one and looking at, at yours. Um, the next one is do local laws that have higher minimum wages mean that the salary requirements for exempt employees are higher in those areas too. So this is a tough one. Tiana, do you wanna, we just had this come up with another client um, yeah. where their city law uh, was not in conflict, but not in compliance with the state law. So Diana, do you wanna talk about this? Yeah, so uh, generally the answer is no, but there's a caveat, there's always a caveat in the law. Um, <laughs> the state law that says that the exempt employee needs to be paid twice minimum wage essentially defines that based on the state minimum wage. So generally, uh, it's not higher. Mm -hmm. The exception is theoretically, and I actually don't know of a city that does this, but it's possible that it exists. A local government could explicitly say the minimum wage for an exempt employee is whatever higher level. So it, it could happen, but generally no. Audrey, I think the rest are for your team. Great, Marissa, I think um, you did the religious accommodation. Yeah, so you know, one of the um, questions is, um, what kind of things should an employer consider when deciding whether to deny um, a religious accommodation request? Um, well, the court kind of gives us a little bit of um, insight there. Um, it's a very fact-intensive inquiry, but I would recommend considering and also documenting, and that's kind of the key component there, um, what the particular accommodation at issue is um, and what's its practical impact um, in light of the size of the business. Um, so, you know, a big Amazon is gonna be different than this, you know, a small local business. Um, their kind of what the nature of the work is, including whether it can be done by somebody else um, and what potential accommodations can be made and the cost thereof and the overall cost of operating the business. So things that should not be considered um, as I kind of flagged before include employee animosity um, towards the accommodation or in um, employee animosity towards like a particular religion um, as the court caution that could be a form of religious bias. Um, and the court also did specifically flag that there is no undue hardship um, imposed by temporary costs, voluntary ship swapping, occasional ship swapping, or administrative costs. Um, so something probably more than that, or that kind of the mere imposition of overtime um, needs to be proved. So those are kind of just some guidance. Um, there's also EEOC kind of guidance that have touched on this issue before. So um, if you're faced with a religious accommodation, you really do think that it's gonna cost you too much money um, that might be time to contact an, an employment attorney as well. Yeah, I think the, um, I agree with everything that, that Marissa said. And I think that employers should really be looking at it in terms of a dialogue or a brainstorming session and make sure that you're, again, documenting that brainstorming session, documenting all of the different ideas that you might be bouncing around with the employee. So it looks like you're really kind of thinking through these things and really keeping an open mind in terms of what might be possible or not possible, and then costing it out, right? So if, if the employee throws something across the table at you and your initial reaction is like, no way, well, why don't you go ahead and prove it up in terms of the dollars that are actually associated with it? And then that'll be good evidence. Um, if it if it is indeed too expensive, it might not be, right? So you, I think the, anytime you do this re reasonable accommodation, there is what the law requires is called the interactive process. And that really should be documented as well, because otherwise it gives a an independent cause of action for it. 
Yeah. And remember the test is, you know, there is the idea of the court kind of discussed this idea that there is going to be some hardship, right? So it has to be an undue hardship. Um, so that's kind of the other thing to keep um, in mind. So um, the second question I'm seeing is what kind of things should we include in our arbitration agreements um, to give us the best chance of enforcing those um, PAGA claims to arbitration? Um, I think the number one thing is a compliance severability clause. And we saw that in Viking River that kind of saved um, that and a severability clause essentially says like, even if this is unenforceable, we're just going to cut out that piece that um, is unlawful. Um, and so that's been kind of the saving grace for a lot of these types of things, which is important when the law is shifting so frequently. Um, and then making sure that you're cutting out um, unenforceable terms, like a wholesale waiver of um, PAGA representative actions that would not be lawful. Um, instead, you want to kind of narrowly tailor it to make sure that um, those individual claims can be um, sent to arbitration. And I would include an explicit statement that to that effect. Um, and then I would also maybe consider including a mandatory stay clause um, kind of in line with this decision um, where an employee agrees to stay any representative PAGA action until the individual PAGA claim concludes um, in arbitration, as that might be persuasive to the court. So. Right. And I think on the, arbit on the arbitration, all of those are really great points, Marissa. I think on the arbitration subject, it's been such a ping pong match, right? Back and forth, back and forth on enforceable, not enforceable, what's unconscionable, how big of a carve out on PAGA, all of those sorts of things. Um, the state of the law has been in constant flux over the last five years with respect to arbitration agreements, but it certainly has been used successfully by a number of defendants to be able to kind of shut down and take the wind out of plaintiff's attorney's sales. Um, but then we're also seeing some plaintiff's attorneys who are saying, you want to go ahead and have a hundred or a thousand um, individual arbitrations? Let's go to it. Uh, and so there's, there's so then you have to pay for it, right? Because there's, yeah, they have to pay for it, right? With the yeah. initial kind of arbitration cost of $3,000 just to kind of get in the door. So there's a lot of kind of like, you know, balances and ideas that you you really should be talking with your attorney about so you really understand the repercussions. And it's going to depend a lot on what does your workforce look like? Is it five people? Is it 2,000 people? Is it manufacturing? Is it service-oriented? You know, what kinds of claims do you actually think um, are going to happen? But in any event, I think it's a good discussion for your attorneys. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And just is it beneficial to you to have an arbitration agreement at all? Like, I think that's actually the first starting point. Um, so that's a really good point, Andre. And I think that's it on our end. Um, I think there's notices that terminate. There's one notices that termination. Um, it looks like that's a um, maybe back to Lindsay. That's in, uh, Let's see here. They need okay. To Spanish. Did you just read it, Angela? I'm sorry. No. What about notices required at termination? Uh, are those required to be provided in other languages? Also, if 10% or more of the employees are Spanish speaking? Again, I would absolutely recommend doing that. Um, is it required under the law? Not necessarily. Um, but how can you legitimately get up before you know, a judge and say, oh, I gave them all these notices. They were, they understood, they signed it when you clearly know that English is not their uh, primary language. So to protect yourself as the employer, it's highly recommended to get uh, important um, documents and notices such as a, a termination notice would be very important, especially because there's a lot of um, additional notices that generally are included when it comes to like benefits and things that may be ending that need to be given to employees. So again, it's very important to have those translated. And if you have any questions specifically about particular notices, you know, when that time comes, definitely reach out to your legal counsel. It's, it's generally not too expensive to get these notices translated. Um, you know, there is some cost to it, but again, it'll save you a lot um, down the line. Right. Um, and when you use a translator, do use a professional translator. Don't, you know, just bring someone in yes. and say, I speak Spanish or I speak yeah. English. Yeah, translate, which we've seen and doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, we've seen people do that. We had a handbook once that was given to us that was partially in Spanish. And it was, we had a couple of people who spoke Spanish come in and say, I do not understand what they were trying to say. So it's like they cut and pasted someone's translation. And that's probably the worst thing you can do. Because that is yeah. very Google, Google Translate 
is not going to work. Right, exactly. Or it can add exactly. ambiguity to it, what's otherwise a clear policy. So where you think you're saying one thing and you're actually giving them rights that you, you might not realize you're giving away or, you know, so that's yes. the downside. Yes. <laughs> yes, and remember contracts are interpreted against the drafter typically. So you want to be very careful. Um, well, we're at that, we're close to the 130 mark. We want to thank everybody so, so much for joining us. Thank you for giving us your lunch hour and a half. Um, we really enjoy doing this. We do it annually as a team um, with Audrey's firm and, and it's wonderful. We're both members of the chamber and on the chamber board and we enjoy giving that way. So um, we just want to say thank you. Audrey, anything um, else? Thank you. Thank you, Angela, and to Lindsay and Deanna and Marissa as well. Thank you for all of you for um, hanging out here. I'm wishing you good compliance with employment <laughs> laws. And, uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you today. All right. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you. Yeah, have a good rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, boy. Okay. So